Never become a prisoner of the Romans, for they will devise a thousand ways to make you wish you were dead. At this time, the Romans were indulging in the pleasure derived from slaughtering their war captives. They cruelly placed an iron helmet over a prisoner's head and then hammered mercilessly at it, continuing until the prisoner's brain burst and the two sides of the helmet closed together, only then ceasing their brutality. Just a day before, Spartacus was betrayed by the pirates, leading to Crassus' Roman army completely surrounding the city where the rebel army resided. After breaching the city gates, Crassus' 10,000-strong army surged in like a tide. Overwhelmed by the sheer number of enemies, Agron had no choice but to lead a few men to retreat towards the back gate. Subsequently, Crassus personally led his troops into the city of Sinuessa to join forces with Caesar. They crazily massacred any refugees who hadn't managed to evacuate. In this critical moment, Spartacus, with Gannicus and others, burst in through the back gate. <laughs> After killing a dozen or so soldiers, Spartacus finally met up with Agron, who informed him that the main gate had been breached and Caesar was a traitor. Hearing this, Spartacus was filled with self-reproach, blaming himself for trusting the pirates. However, as a leader, Spartacus quickly regained his composure, with the rebel army at the back gate not yet fully evacuated and many people still trapped in the city. The urgent task was to ensure their safe retreat to the mountains, but time was running out as Crassus' army was about to reach the back gate. To buy time for everyone to evacuate, Spartacus volunteered to cover the rear, but Gannicus stopped him. Gannicus, understanding the importance of Spartacus as a leader, knew his death would be a fatal blow. So, he stepped forward to cover the rear. Knowing every second was precious and with many refugees still needing evacuation in the city, Spartacus, after a brief farewell, hurriedly left with Crixus and others. I would not greet this night out loud. Gannicus was not just a brute force fighter. He, along with Donner, went to the granary, planning to set fire to it to distract the enemy. There, Gannicus encountered Sybil, who had not managed to escape. As a fellow slave, Gannicus couldn't bear to leave Sybil behind, so he decided to flee with her. Normally, seeing the granary on fire would cause the enemy to divert forces to extinguish it. But Crassus was no ordinary man. He ignored Caesar's advice and ordered his entire army to advance towards the back gate to continue pursuing Spartacus. Seeing that the plan had failed, Gannicus intentionally exposed himself and engaged in a desperate fight with the enemy. During the battle, Donner was unfortunately wounded and captured by the enemy. Although Gannicus eventually killed the small enemy troop, he now had Sybil, a woman with no combat ability, by his side. Gannicus had no choice but to take Sybil and hide for the time being. At this time, Spartacus had already reached the back gate where many slaves had yet to evacuate, while he was directing everyone to evacuate. A large number of Roman soldiers had already broken through. To buy time for the evacuation, Spartacus, along with Crixus and others, fiercely charged towards the enemy ready to fight to the death. As they saw the enemy forces increasingly gathering and realized that they would eventually be overwhelmed and perish on the spot. Crixus, in a moment of quick thinking, threw pitch onto the ropes of the drawbridge. Spartacus, understanding his intention, immediately grabbed a torch and threw it, setting the ropes on fire. As the ropes were about to snap, Crixus found an opportunity to escape. Spartacus was left alone, still desperately holding on. At this moment, Crassus and Caesar also arrived. This was the first face-to-face -face encounter between Spartacus and Crassus. Crassus, with a triumphant smile, immediately ordered Spartacus to be captured alive. But Spartacus did not give him the opportunity, escaping just one second before the city gate closed. I'm about to lay inevitable fall. Bring Ram to bear, sentries to guard, sundered gateway. We do not follow? In time. Sweep the city for any of his followers that yet hold breath so that we may rob them of it in celebration of glorious victory. Crassus decided to station his troops in the city and ordered a citywide manhunt for the surviving members of the rebel army. Meanwhile, Gannicus and Sybil were hiding in a secret passage beneath the stables. How would they escape the city full of Roman soldiers? A veritable dragon's den? Crassus' victory was commended by the Senate. It was the first victory for the Roman army since Spartacus' rebellion. Crassus planned to slaughter the war prisoners as a celebration and invited Metellus to stay and enjoy the gruesome spectacle. Metellus gladly agreed. After Metellus left, 
Caesar was puzzled as to why Crassus did not continue pursuing Spartacus. At this time, Spartacus and his rebel army had escaped to the Milia mountain peaks. This situation was strikingly similar to when Glaber had Spartacus cornered at Vesuvius. You believe me, the fool? I believe you a man of infinite plots. The thing that has propelled us to the ground we now stand upon, and in briefest passing shall claim Spartacus and all those who yet follow the doom of his shadow. But Crassus merely smiled faintly, as if everything was under his control. In the afternoon, Crassus ordered Leda to be brought into the city, bound. Seeing this, Caesar felt compassion and immediately ordered the soldiers to unbind Leda. Caesar was there to convey Crassus' orders. Crassus had arranged for Leda to have a rose bath in his mansion, which delighted her greatly. Leda thought that with the Roman army recapturing the city of Sinuessa, she could regain her noble status, but when Leda arrived before Crassus, she was completely stunned. The city is yours, mighty Crassus. I would see to agreed upon price for aiding in its return to Roman hands. You set bargain with this fucking shit. Mm -hmm. One of greatest cost. It turned out that Heraclio, who had been chopped down and fallen into the sea, had not died. His purpose for coming was to claim his reward. In addition to a shipload of gold and silver treasures, the young and beautiful Leda was also given as a supplementary gift to Heraclio. Meanwhile, Corre, who had been dishonored by Tiberius, also arrived in the city, extremely guarded and sensitive to Crassus' touch. Just as she was about to tell Crassus everything that had recently happened, Tiberius walked in and interrupted her. Corre dared not say more. At this time, Crassus was unaware of what had happened. After arranging for Corre to prepare food, he began to counsel his son. Crassus felt that Tiberius had matured and become more steady in recent days and promised to restore his position soon. This time, Crassus summoned Tiberius to preside over the execution of the prisoners as a way to gain attention, paving the way for Tiberius to regain military command in the future. The ultimate purpose of the ceremony was to publicize Caesar's achievements. Hearing this, Tiberius was displeased, as he had always been at odds with Caesar and did not want to be overshadowed by him. But Crassus told him that a wise man knows how to turn an enemy into a friend. Caesar, being brave and cunning, would surely achieve great things in the future, befriending him would be immensely beneficial, and the path to politics would become smoother. Tiberius took his father's words to heart and then found Corre in the wine cellar. Tiberius warned Corre that if she dared to reveal his assault on her, he would make sure she met a terrible end. Corre was utterly despairing but powerless. Afterwards, Tiberius went to Caesar's room, intending to have a friendly conversation. However, to his surprise, Caesar humiliated him in the same way Tiberius had once humiliated him. Caesar contrasted his achievements with Tiberius' military failures, leaving Tiberius with no dignity and furiously storming out. In the evening, the execution of the war prisoners began. Compared to Crixus and Naivia's treatment of prisoners, Crassus' brutality was a million times worse. This was not just slaughter, it was a beastly, inhumane desecration of living people. Watching this bloody spectacle, the faces of the Roman officers were filled with pleasure and excitement. At that moment, Metellus suddenly thought that the survivors of the city should return, but Crassus said there were no survivors, not even the magistrate's wife, Leta who had left the city and would never return. Metellus then realized that Crassus wanted to take possession of the city. Metellus' face darkened immediately, stating that the Senate would never easily agree to such a greedy request. However, Crassus mentioned he would gift Metellus a mansion and a portion of the port's tax revenues. We have done the impossible. Surely we should be rewarded for it. At this point, the ceremony was reaching its final stage. Traditionally, the last kill symbolized the pinnacle of victory. To humiliate Caesar and avenge past humiliations, Tiberius deliberately stirred up the crowd's emotions, giving the honor of the final kill to Caesar. With no way to refuse, Caesar agreed. The last prisoner was Donner, who had been with Gannicus. Donal was wounded and captured by Roman soldiers. As Caesar was enjoying the cheers, Tiberius quietly unlocked Donner's shackles. Caesar instantly understood Tiberius' scheme, but to prove his strength, he offered Donner a fair duel and generously handed him a sword. Despite being severely injured before his capture, Donner, a gladiator from the arena, 
still managed to overpower the high-ranking Roman officer. However, Caesar, not relying solely on brute strength, found an opportunity to elbow Donner's wound. Let this man's death serve as harbinger for the fight that we shall inflict upon Spartacus himself! Well fought, brother. Swallow cock, you Roman shit! Just as Caesar was about to decapitate him, Donner thrust a sword into his own throat. Choosing suicide, Donner preferred a gruesome death over being used as a tool for Roman propaganda. Crassus stepped in to ease the awkward situation. The greatest warriors take their own lives in fear of Caesar! <laughs> Tiberius was furious. His plan not only failed, but also elevated Caesar's prestige in the army. He glared at Caesar venomously, signaling that this silent war was far from over. He is a favorite character among many fans in the Spartaca saga. Let's see how he managed to escape from the city with two women, amidst a tight siege, as if he was in an uninhabited land. Just now, Danicus had voluntarily stayed behind to hold off the enemy, covering the retreat of the rebel army. However, after the rebel army's safe withdrawal, the entire city was occupied by Crassus' Roman legion. Danicus and Sybil were forced to hide in a secret passage beneath a stable in the city. But the crisis was not over. Roman soldiers were conducting a thorough search throughout the city. They were dismantling every floorboard, determined to exterminate any refugees who hadn't escaped in time. Just then, a soldier discovered the secret passage, and it seemed they were about to be caught. Danicus handed Sybil a dagger, suggesting that if he was captured, it would be better for her to end her own life. Being captured by them would be a fate far worse than death. Having said this, Danicus engaged in a deadly fight with a small group of Roman soldiers above. As Sybil listened to the intense combat, her heart raced with anxiety. Suddenly, a sword pierced through the wooden planks, and blood dripped onto Sybil's face, filling her with despair. As the door to the hiding place slowly opened, Sybil, already prepared to end her own life, raised her dagger. They climbed onto the rooftop, where they found mule soldiers on patrol showing no signs of decreasing, while they were at a loss. Danicus suddenly spotted Heraclio passing by the guard post with Leta bound. From their conversation, it was clear that the villainous Heraclio planned to satisfy his lust in a nearby cabin. Danicus finally thought of a way to escape. He planned to steal Heraclio's pass, specially authorized by Crassus. Soon after, Heraclio took Leda into a small room and branded her arm with his mark, turning the once noblewoman of Rome into a pirate slave. As Heraclio prepared to unleash his lust, Danicus stormed in furiously, without giving Heraclio a chance to speak. Danicus raised his sword and slashed at his opponent. As a former god of the arena, he was able to deal with these little rogues without any problems. <laughs> However, during their fight, Heraclio seized Sybil. Just as Heraclio was threatening Ganicus, he failed to notice Leda approaching from behind. Ganicus rushed to remove Heraclio's clothes in the pass. As they were about to leave, Sybil couldn't bear to leave Leda behind. But Ganicus believed that as a Roman noblewoman, Leda was not one of them and should not accompany them. Stand nothing but a slave, as you once did. <laughs> With no other choice, Ganicus, disguised as Heraclio, prepared to escape the city under the cover of night with the two women. Approaching the city gate, Danicus saw two horses by the road. He thought of stealing the horses for a quick escape but unexpectedly encountered Caesar, who had just returned from the ceremony. Caesar, recognizing Leda, became suspicious and stopped them for questioning. Just as they were about to be exposed, Danicus immediately drew his sword for a desperate fight. <laughs> Caesar was no match for Ganicus, who wounded him with his sword. As more mule soldiers gathered, Ganicus kicked a nearby fire basin to block their pursuit, then turned and galloped away with Sybil. At the city gate, they found it blocked by soldiers, but Ganicus didn't back down. He charged through, slashing wildly at the Roman soldiers like a god descending from the heavens. During the chaos, Leta was unfortunately stabbed, but Ganicus rescued her in time. Leta, enduring severe pain, finally escaped the city. Ganicus, pulling on the reins of the warhorse, 
let out a triumphant yell as the horse crushed the head of the last soldier underfoot. Seeing Caesar approaching, Danicus smirked in contempt. He threw down the Roman eagle standard, a symbol of their so-called noble honor, and left with Sybil. Back at the command camp, an injured Caesar complained to Crassus. Why not order the pursuit of the main rebel army instead of forcing Caesar to risk his life killing every traitor personally? But Crassus remained calm and confident, assuring Caesar he had already planned a strategy against Spartacus. By sunrise the next day, it would be the end for the rebel group. Meanwhile, Spartacus' rebel army was trapped in the frigid, snow-covered peaks of the Milia Mountains, lacking winter supplies. Many had fallen in the snow, as the leaders were discussing their next steps. Danicus arrived with Leda and Sybil, finally reuniting with the main force. I believe myself a difficult man to kill. <laughs> Everyone was overjoyed to see Ganicus safe and sound. At this moment, Leda was seriously injured and dying. Spartacus immediately carried her down and arranged for her to receive. Spartacus then showed Ganicus their dire situation. Ganicus realized why Crassus was not in a hurry to pursue them. The snow-covered mountains were barren, flanked by towering peaks. With a deep trench dug by Crassus in front and high walls erected above, this meant if Crassus' 10,000-strong army attacked from behind, the rebel army would face a dead end. 